Um, the topic today I wanted to talk about is how we now know that the uh, emergence of what we call art uh, is actually a global phenomenon. For many, many years, we have always thought about it as being sort of the origin in Southwestern Europe because of the preservation of an amazing number of what we would call decorated caves. So today what I'm going to do is um, hopefully talk about, let's see if I can get this to um, go, right, have three parts of the talk. At the beginning, I'm just gonna talk a little bit, very little bit about why art has been such a prominent uh, feature of our origin stories and how we define who we are as humans. And I'll then go to some key dates in telling the story that uh, we now know is a very global uh, experience of early and the earliest arts. And also the other part of knowing about global phenomenon manifestations of early imagery is also that research itself has gotten globalized. And uh, so we've got many different participants from many different intellectual and cultural tradition uh, all coordinating thanks to technologies like that which we're enjoying right now. So the question is, why do we value art so much um, as being a marker of culture, of high cognition, and being modern? Um, actually, this derives from uh, beliefs of the Western uh, basis of enlightenment. And for example, and I don't know if you all can see it, but there's a picture on the right here uh, that has a uh, drawing done in the 19th century before any cave art on the walls was actually discovered. But by then we already knew that people were creating images on pieces of bone and antler and stone. So here we have a uh, image of a prehistoric person standing there uh, painting with his hand on his hip as if he's a, um, an artist of the Western tradition. So we already see that the representation of uh, what we thought uh, the early arts were all about is actually already embodied as a Western male artist, which is of course the beginning of a longstanding uh, assumption about who makes art and why art is important. Uh, let's see, my goodness, this is not happening here. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna have to go back. My slide is not um, advancing here. Oh, even though, and now it's not even escaping, right? Oh, what is next? Wow, I wonder why that's not working. Worked yesterday, right? <laughs> yes, we tested this. That's right, yeah, so let me see, it won't even close out, so maybe I'll stop sharing and go back and share again. Let's see what I can get rid of the, right. All right, let's see if we go here. All right, how does, is this working or no? Uh, no, it's not, wait a sec, I will. Go back here and share screen. Okay. Hmm. All right. Well. Should be screen sharing. All right, let's see. Do we got have it now? Yep. Okay. All right. So one of the interesting things about early art is that we actually have not valued all of the early art or the non-Western art um, the same. So while we have definitely valued, as you can see here on the front of a Newsweek magazine, uh, we've definitely valued the art in Europe. Um, uh, art is part of our legacy. Below it, we see the um, manifestation and the excitement about Lascaux being called the first masterpiece of humanity. But many of these other arts, such as the art of um, Native Americans, uh, the you can see a great a mural here from Baja, California, some of the Australian art, and a really important book uh, that really takes up this question by Howard Morphy. 
uh, reminds us that while we have celebrated the early arts of uh, Europe, We've not done such a good job of valuing some of the arts of some of these other um, people. Now the chronology for early art and recognizing it starts in the late 19th century uh, with the very famous discovery of Altamira in Northern Spain, which for 25 years was considered to be a hoax uh, that early people could not possibly have made some of this amazing imagery that as you can see, takes advantage of the bumps and the rocks uh, to make these bison on the ceiling at um, Altamira. Um, but in 1902, we have finally, they recognize, okay, uh, this is something that was made by prehistoric peoples. Uh, and it of course took a lot of different kinds and lines of evidence in order to convince people uh, that this was the case. And we finally have something that we don't see often enough. Uh, here is a retraction uh, by uh, Emil Cartayac that, oh, he made a mistake. Um, uh, I do now see that this actually could be um, made by prehistoric peoples once they found stratigraphic profiles that covered the art, the, the stuff in the profiles, the uh, archeology span was uh, considered to be very old, had, had bones in it of now extinct species. So they were sort of forced into a corner to recognizing this. And of course, from there, it's taken off. So this is really a Eurocentric view that began um, because the researchers were Europeans. The field of prehistory was at the time in the 19th century was brand new, but the terms of prehistory were being set in Europe, the definition of fields, time zones, things like the Paleolithic, the Neolithic, these were all terms that came from the um, uh, prehistorians, many of whom were of course not trained in prehistory, but uh, came from other fields. And then of course, the continued research and exploration and discovery uh, was definitely also European. So the archeology span at that time led to the view that it was here at the site, for example, of Cro-Magnon in um, Southwestern Europe, that's in France, that modern humans and us uh, appeared. And so the birth of art was considered to be from Europe. Uh, a Eurocentric kind of, of, of view. And I see my, um, uh, let's see if this will go now. So our next key date is 1940, which was when we discovered, or when this cave site of Lesco was discovered, again, down here in the southwestern part of France, which was, again, considered to be an absolutely phenomenal site. The problem with Lesco is that it had too many visitors, was closed to the public for the first time in 1963. Uh, replicas have been made and an infection now uh, has covered it. So you can see a picture of Lesco in bandages in the year 2000. Um, so it's even closed to researchers. So some of the major uh, sort of uh, considered to be the highlights, the best um, of cave art, uh, has actually been viewed and overviewed, and this is one of the challenges in its preservation. But of course, the access to these sites, where they're located, the connection to a notion of Western heritage of great value, along with continued discoveries, which are made possible by the Western academic and cultural institution and funds, have all promoted for many, many years a Eurocentric understanding of the origins of art. And of course, the very context of this early art were places of wonderful preservation. Limestone caves are really great for preservation uh, because they're uh, not acidic, they're alkaline, many of them were closed, hermetically sealed by collapses. And so the, all of these factors together contribute to a long-standing impact. My colleague, uh, late colleague, Desmond Clark, always loved this map that's here on the left. Desmond was a, a giant in uh, archeology span of Africa. And he said, well, that's great, Meg. Look, you've got this square box around the caves, but what is that huge continent doing to the south of it? And isn't there something uh, there? Oh, I see every time I have to do this, I have to do the next thing. All of this, of course, was uh, this Eurocentrism was supported by the fact that the images really resonated with a visual schema of naturalism that is highly valued to us. 
Uh, and so they also thought <clears throat> that, gosh, we also have not only early art, but we have an ongoing and a tradition of art so you can see on the uh, right here, the Chauvet Cave dating to about 36,000 years ago for some of its images, and Lascaux uh, on the left there at 17,000 years ago. Now that's there's just between those two cave sites, the 17,000 years of ongoing uh, engagement with coming into caves and making animal images that appealed really to us. But as Desmond said, what about that huge continent to the south, especially as we began to realize that our own species, Homo sapiens sapiens, seems to appear there first and at thousands of years before the Cro-Magnon site. Uh, hundreds of thousands of years, I might add at this point, given that we're sort of talking about Homo sapiens sapiens in Africa at more than 200,000 years ago and Cro-Magnon, that's only at 45,000 years ago. So, uh, here we go. And of course, we see that as early as 1969, uh, there was a cave discovered in, uh, called the Apollo 11 cave because of the Apollo 11 going off at 25,500 years ago. And of course, since then, we've got uh, caves, uh, Blompos, a coastal South African site with engravings with ochre enhancement on it. And so we're really beginning to see that some of the ideas we had about the premier notion. Uh, so the debates began. We in Africa, said African archaeologists, are not second fiddle to the long-standing prominence of southwestern Europe. And then the debates began. What can we infer about the human mind from various artifacts? Does pattern cross-hatching really allow us to infer a symbolic mind that any what was fully abstract thought <clears throat> And how do we uh, evaluate this? And what is the evidence? And then, of course, we have now even earlier uses of things like ochre, uh, one of the coloring materials, a mineral red hematite, in East Africa at more than 300,000 years ago. So we've actually started to expand uh, as we well we should have. So as the discoveries expand, hu early humans around the globe Researchers noted the early presence of on-the-move human groups in places like Australia. The shifts in the human evolutionary story have increased, and so it's not surprising that discoveries of all sorts of human visual and material practices have been documented um, in other places than Southwestern Europe. I have to keep going back here to, uh, right. So one question is, whoa, maybe even Neanderthals and perhaps other pre-sapiens also made images. And there's been a recent flurry uh, just in the last couple of years about this, including a cover story on the prestigious journal Science about the possibility, uh, the authors of course were arguing that they have evidence from a specific kind of dating using uranium and thorium calcite coverings uh, over red, red pigments, um, that maybe even Neanderthals had done this because the dates were such that they were before we have evidence for modern humans in Europe. These are um, from uh, Spain primarily. Um, and of course, what we're debating here is both the dating method and then the fact that we have enormous amount of evidence about Neanderthals, archeological evidence that doesn't suggest any uh, kind of uh, visual marking that has preserved. So the debates go on. As you can see, one of the articles uh, is the early dates for Neanderthal cave art may be wrong, but that's the dating methodology. Uh, who knows? It, it's, it's not impossible, especially now that everybody's gotten a little more comfortable about Neanderthals, because now many of us have Neanderthal genetic material because indeed Neanderthals interacted with modern humans. Then we also now know that the peopling of what is today Australia called Sahul, there is strong evidence that rock art, first engraving and then pigment use, was integral to the social networks that facilitated the dispersal of humans across uh, diverse environments of Australia. And we now know that Australia, well, was probably occupied by modern humans maybe 50,000 years ago, which again would even precede um, the dates that we got at Cro-Magnon. So we have uh, evidence that long extinct fauna, for example, uh, were depicted 
Uh, and we have, for example, this emu or an ostrich-like bird that was gone by 40,000 years ago is being depicted on the wall. Every time I have to do this, right? So the locations of sites here you can see on this map of F that have evidence for very early symbolic behavior. In Australia, there's shell beads, there's um, ritual burial, there's ochre and ochre processing and pigments on shelter walls and wall, wall, wall markings and then of course some very special kinds of axes. So again, we can do as uh, George Chalupka has done in his book, Journey in Time, trace a 50,000 year story of the Australian Aboriginal rock art of Arnhem Land up, uh, in the north of uh, Australia. And now, get this one. This one took everybody by surprise to a certain extent, but the dates for this early art in Borneo uh, down here, uh, where this is the tip of Australia, you can see here uh, in Sulawesi, it can now actually be demonstrated to go at the opposite end of the world, of the Pleistocene Eurasian world. And so we have a uh, pig deer here, as it's called, outline and uh, hand stencils. And again, they're using the uranium thorium dating method, which in this case seems to have worked uh, very well. So where are we? No one is now debating that early humans around the world made and engaged in marking, making, using pigments and other natural materials. For me, what it means is we're really liberated from having to think about the origins of art. Instead, we need like to look at what was it going on in every local place in Southwestern Europe, in Borneo, in Australia, in South Africa, uh, what kind of cultural contexts were at work that really sort of led to the uh, engagement, the making of imagery, the putting it on cave walls or other location. Um, and so we really get a much more interesting anthropological question rather than trying to talk about the origins and the spread of art from one place, even though, of course, one gets a lot of publicity if you say you've got the first, the earliest, and the, the big discovery, so the seduction there. We also now have a lot of debate about all the dating methods, because for most of art, the cave art in France and Spain uh, is made with minerals, and these are manganese and hematite, and you can't use some of our traditional met dating methods, such as carbon-14, which is based on organic materials. It's only really been with the charcoal made uh, images that we've been able to date them or other associated or relative dating kinds of methods. So now we're just really in a, a hot debate about how useful and what are the methods for using some of these uh, kind of dating techniques. So here we are, we're at a really exciting point. Uh, we've got to exercise our brains. We've got a lot of opportunities ahead. We've got to open our eyes, but the story is now that modern humans, anatomically modern humans, and possibly our Neanderthal predecessors in Europe, were actually engaged in a making a very remarkable, uh, exciting visual world for probably all sorts of different reasons, and leaving us uh, the rich heritage, uh, not just in Southwestern Europe, uh, but all around the globe in various circumstances, uh, we're humans, all of us are deeply committed to having to make meaning in our lives uh, through the material world. Great, I'll take any questions. Well, thank you, yes. If uh, people wanna send me their questions, you can use the chat function in the Zoom. Um, so we have one uh, from Peter. Do we have evidence to indicate whether Paleolithic art was the work of the general population or of a few special individuals at specific periods in time? So uh, were the Altamira bulls now suggested to be the work of one person or things right. like that? Great question. Um, the, it, it varies. Of course, we have hundreds of thousands of images. And so what we see, what were shown, Alasco, those bulls and Altamira and so forth are just a small selection. So there's lots of what we would might call scribbles or um, 
with little sort of doodles or markings or whatever. But by focusing on some of them, I think, for example, at Chauvet, they've been able to show pretty well that at least those four horses that are so famous from there were done by the same hand, the same sort of um, style and technique and that they all are related to each other. Uh, and in other cases, I'm sure that there were uh, a number of individuals who were contributing. We have no idea whether uh, people went into the cave once and just did what they were gonna do once or whether people came, whether they added to it over time. Uh, we can tell that in some cases, they're putting images on top of images. In some caves, you can actually see that they erased previous images and then put uh, new images over them. Uh, and uh, some of us have argued that a lot of the uh, imagery is not made because somebody sat down and had a plan, okay, we're gonna put a bison here and a bison there, uh, but actually went in and there's um, a, an exciting dialectical between the shape of the cave wall and the images, almost as if in some instances, say with the bison from Altamira, those, those bumps on the ceiling actually evoked a notion of bison rumps, and that by touching it up, they actually pull the bison out of the wall rather than thinking in our sort of Western notion of what quote unquote art is about as they're putting a bison on the wall. So there's a lot of ways in which animal images and other images are actually e sort of eked out, much the way we know that many Inuit um, Alaskan um, uh, artists who today carve, uh, when you say, will you please make me um, a bear out of this piece of ivory? And they say, no, I won't make you a bear. If there's a bear in this ivory, I will try to get it out. Excellent. Um, so I have another question about um, if there's any way that you can know the gender of any of the artists or how, you know, in the future people might try and figure that out. Right. Well, of course, that's a challenging question. Um, knowing whether they even had a notion of gender like we do is another whole uh, matter that, you know, to be discussed. Um, but uh, in terms of who was doing the image making, uh, the, at the moment, um, there have been some studies based on some general hypotheses about hands, about the uh, relationship of the digits that tend to uh, fall along a continuum where females today uh, have certain patterns of digits in relationship especially to the these two first first and second fingers here um, and so many of the handprints have suggested that there actually were some female handprints um, we, we also know that there's evidence for children in caves, some small footprints, and it is assumed that it's likely that there were um, members of both groups, uh, if in fact um, they recognize males versus females, men versus women only. Um, so it's very difficult to tell the gender in our terms of anything prehistorically. Um, and, you know, DNA analysis will, you know, give you a, a hint but as, as yet, we have yet to extract DNA from any of these paintings. So it's a tough issue, but I think my basic premise is that if we can't tell whether it's male or female, we shouldn't assume that it's just male, which has been the situation ever since. So if we can't tell either, we've got to assume that it's possibility uh, both, and especially if we're dealing with making images over so many thousands of years, um, the probability that there were a variety of makers has got to be entertained. Yes, definitely. I agree with that. Um, another question that we have is we are pushing back the dates and expanding the geography and where do archaeologists look next and what are the new technologies or new scholarly perspectives that can help answer the next set of questions about early artistic expression? Wow, that sounds like a course. <laughs> yes, <Yeah>, right? <laughs> Um, well, I, you know, I think the, for example, Chauvet Cave, which was discovered in the mid 1990s, uh, you know, was discovered because of a couple of spelunkers who knew what they were doing. And, uh, so there are probably many collapsed limestone structures that could be 
um, explored, uh, at least in the heartland, as it's called, of Southwestern Europe. Uh, but I think the fact that people are uh, looking in uh, sites of, of strong preservation in Australia, in Southeast Europe, uh, I think, of course, we also need to do more exploration in par other parts of the world, such as in um, uh, Mongolia and Siberia and places like that, as well as in North, North America. Um, so uh, I think it's uh, possible, but of course, there's always politics involved. There's always uh, getting research funds involved. Um, and we do have a lot of wonderful new technologies in archaeology. Perhaps today, yesterday, people saw the story about how they've discovered all sorts of new associated um, uh, monuments or structures related to Stonehenge. Uh, which were uh, discovered completely by using uh, remote sensing and ground penetrating radar. Uh, no need to excavate when you can use some of these exploratory techniques, which are really good. Um, and in many cases here in North America are really important because our native indigenous peoples um, are definitely opposed to our, you know, really penetrating and breaking the earth. Uh, and we now can help find uh, things and help um, groups with their understanding some of their histories uh, by using these non-invasive techniques. So certainly in the area of dating and the area of non-invasive geophysical techniques is where some of the major new innovative ways of working in archaeology are going. Perfect. Um, to sort of wrap up our questions, we have way more than we have time to answer. So I'm sorry if we don't get to your question, but I've had a couple about um, asking about volunteer, volunteering on sites that are currently open and where they can find more information specifically about the site you are working on. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> uh, I, in general, right now, of course, the world is on hold, so there's not too much uh, active uh, archaeology going on at the moment. Most of us are not in the field. Um, I wish I were. You can see the Pyrenees where I work in the background here. Um, and uh, we, we just don't have a field season this year. Uh, the site I've been working on, uh, Père Blanc, in southwestern France in the Ariège region, so in the foothills of the Pyrenees. Um, you can see a website. Uh, there's a website that also has a, a posting on there of a, um, a video that was done uh, because what we've got is a 10 meter long uh, structure dating to about 19,000 years ago built by the hunter-gatherers in the region, uh, and lots of pigments from our site. We don't have any, so to speak, so far, but um, uh, we know that these people were engaged with pigments. I think both the Archaeological Institute of America and the Society for American Archaeology have resources about um, uh, participating and so forth uh, in various kinds of uh, volunteer circumstances. And I'm happy to respond to any of you if you would just want to send me an email personally. My email address is meg at berkeley.edu, so it shouldn't be too hard. Perfect. Well, thank you, Dr. Conkey, for joining us today. Um, for everyone else, this video will be posted to the YouTube channels of the Robert S. Peabody um, and the um, MAS, the Mass Archaeological Society. Um, you can also go to peabody.andover.edu for the sort of slate of our upcoming speakers, um, which occur every other Wednesday through November. And our next speaker is going to be Dr. Alex Martin, who will be speaking about the historical archaeology um, up in Strawberry Bank Museum up in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. So please join us in two weeks for that. And thank you again, Dr. Conkey, and thank you everyone else for uh, coming and joining us today. So thank you for the chance. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, everyone. Hopefully see you in two weeks. Bye.